I'd like to look um, this afternoon at uh, two figures which correspond to each other. Uh, the two figures really have to be considered together to give us a complete picture. Um, and those two figures are the rock that was smitten in Horeb and the rock that God told Moses to speak to in Kadesh. If we could read them both, Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And now if we could turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 20, and verse 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, unto the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made, up, made us to come up out of Egypt, to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. The, um, we're well, we're uh, familiar with the figure of the rock, uh, it speaks, of course, it sets forth God in his deity. Uh, there can be no um, uh, uh, d 
doubt about that. The scriptures themselves uh, give that figure as belonging to God only. Uh, if we turn to Psalm 18, 31, uh, the psalmist says, For who is God save Jehovah? Or who is a rock save our God? That's a rhetorical question. It can only have one answer. There is none other who can be called a rock except for God. And uh, these, these two figures we've read, well, we can um, uh, turn to uh, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and there uh, the Apostle clearly uh, speaks of this uh, that happens to the children of Israel. Um, he, he applies the figure to the Lord himself. And so he says um, in verse 4, They did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So we have the figure applied for us. Uh, the rock, the water that flows from the rock, is that blessing, that life, that salvation, uh, which flows from the Lord Jesus, who was smitten uh, at Calvary. Um, and uh, uh, in the previous chapter, of course, we have the manhood of the Lord Jesus in the manor. Um, in um, uh, John chapter 6, verse 51, the Lord says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So there we have the manhood of the Lord Jesus, that, um, uh, uh, that true and proper manhood of, of the Lord Jesus. He must become a man in order to die for men. But also, if he was to effect that glorious work of redemption, he must be God. Because that, uh, uh, the sin of man is against the eternal God. And in order to make atonement in regard uh, for, those, for the sins of men, only one who in himself is eternal could do it. Could he take up that work and complete it? And so we have the Lord Jesus who is both God and man. And here it's particularly his deity in view in this figure. Um, but we have the, um, the sinfulness of Israel very much brought to the fore in this, uh, in this passage we've read. It's the sinfulness of Israel, their responsibility before God, and God's wrath against sin. This is really what is before us here in this figure. And so we read in verse 2 of the people contending with Moses um, and in doing so as Moses says tempting God uh, not believing God uh, saying that God has a malign has malign intent towards them he doesn't care for them he doesn't love them he doesn't want their blessing he's brought them into this place because he wants them to die there uh, this is all unbelief. <coughs> they didn't simply take the word of God and trust him. Uh, they doubted God. They didn't believe him. So when something came up which caused them affliction, they didn't turn to him. <coughs> Rather, they turned, they turned against him. And in this, we see the sinful nature of man. And uh, the result of that sinful nature in what they say and what they do against God and against the one whom God has raised up and given them as a deliverer, as a saviour, Moses. And of course in that we see shade, we see a, a foreshadowing of what is to come because that's the sinful nature of Israel. And we should really say this is not talking about the heart of the Israelites. It's talking about the heart of man. Because there's no such thing as the heart of the Jew. 
or the heart, or, or, an, or the English heart, or the German heart, or the French heart. It's the human heart. And so, it's the human heart that is before us here. And um, as we've said, it foreshadows the time when that heart will be manifested in all its wickedness, in its rejection of Christ as their saviour, and their casting him out and crucifying him. And so Moses, he cries unto the Lord in verse 4, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to kill me. Uh, in Derby translation, What shall I do with this people? Yet a little while, and they will stone me. Moses, in both these types, in both these figures, he would really consistently, I think, set forth the law. What the law can't do, and what the law does. Um, when he comes before the Lord and says these things, really, he's showing us this very thing. He's showing, first of all, that he can't do anything with this people. What shall I do with this people? He doesn't know what to do with them. He can't change them in any way. He can't make them uh, believe. He can't make them obedient. Uh, what shall I do? He's at the end of his tether, as it were. He, he's, re he re he's reached the end of what he can do with them. Uh, he can't reform them. Um, and so the law also, we read of it in Romans uh, chapter 8 verse 3, that the law is uh, weak on account of the flesh, it's unprofitable on account of the flesh. Uh, all the law can do is to say to man, this is what you must do. <coughs> but the law can't make uh, man do that. All he can do is demand that he does it, and then he has no power in doing anything, in reforming man's nature. Um, uh, then all, he can, all the law can do is to condemn man. And so Moses says, he, all he can do is bring Israel's sin before God. That they're, they're just about to stone me, he says. The one whom God has given them as a deliverer, Moses comes to God and he says, they're going to kill me. Uh, they're just on the very verge of doing that. And so that's, that's the thing that the law does. It exposes sin. And in Romans 3, verse 20, Paul tells us that by the law is the knowledge of sin. It makes sin plain, apparent. Uh, it shows man to be what he is. And so Moses is a picture of the law throughout this figure, and we'll see that. And so, the Lord commands Moses uh, to take the elders with him, or of the elders, and to take his rod and uh, to uh, go to the Mount Horeb. The elders, uh, they would speak of man's... Uh, or Israel's particularly, um, responsibility and accountability to God. Um, the rod would speak of God's uh, hatred of sin, his holiness, and the fact that sin, he must bring judgment upon the sin. Uh, the rod, in general, it speaks of God's, um, his, his authority and his power. It's like the scepter in the hand of the king. God's authority, that is to say, uh, his right to do something, his right to do what, his own will. The, the power, his power, his ability to do his own will. And so we have both authority and power in the rod. Um, but um, sometimes the rod uh, is spoken of as a staff. 
The words seem almost interchangeable. I notice Mr. Darby translates it as his staff. But the staff has another thought. Although it's the same power, uh, the power by which God is able to do whatever he desires to do, uh, the staff speaks of his power exercised in love towards us. In Ephesians, we read of both his um, rod and his staff. Uh, in Ephesians, particularly, we read of God's power to, to work all things after the pleasure of his own will. Uh, but we read of his love and the exercise of that power in love towards us. If we turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, uh, verse 20, we read of that power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Perhaps this is the greatest, um, greatest testimony of his power, that he can work all things according to, to his own purpose in glory. Even the matter of uh, dis the, the, uh, the, the destroying of death, the rising up, the raising up of his son from the dead, in that he showed uh, that nothing could prevent him in his power, uh, in his authority. But we read that that power, the exceeding greatness of his power, we read it is toward us. And so the same power whereby he does these glorious things for his own glory um, is the power which is toward us day by day. The might whereby he would uh, hold us up, give us strength to walk in the way that is pleasing to him. We read that again in Ephesians chapter 3. <coughs> verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. David, you remember in the Psalm 23, he spoke about both the rod and the staff. Um, though, though I uh, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It was a comfort to David to know that in the hand of his God was the rod. Whatever affliction he was passing through, God uh, would deliver him from every affliction. God would work out his own counsels by his own power. And David, as it were, he found comfort in the power and the authority of his God, but also the staff, that, that God would hold him up. Um, when he fainted, uh, he would be restored. Uh, he would be able to walk, not in his own strength, but in the strength that um, God gave him. And again, God has given that rod and staff into the hands of the Lord himself. And so the Lord would say, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's the rod. But also in this same epistle of Ephesians, we read... Um, uh, finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might that's the start but the rod was put into the hands of Moses and here um, God uh, describes that rod he, the character that, that it's taking here he doesn't say the rod uh, that you held over the Red Sea and the waters parted he says the rod that thou smotest the river. That was the river in Egypt. We read about it in um, Exodus chapter 7. <coughs> in 
verse 17. And um, that was uh, one of the signs which Moses gave to Pharaoh. He smote the river and it turned into blood. And the, the, the signs that followed, there were ten plagues that followed that. And um, I think it's generally, I think it's right to say that those plagues were really upon Egypt and everything that Egypt produced. Um, all that Egypt had built up, its, it's, it's uh, wealth, its cattle, uh, its people, everything they had, those plagues fell upon that in speaking of God's judgment. But the rod smiting the river, that was, that was before those plagues fell. And at the very beginning, God was saying, it's not just what evil, it's not just what Egypt produces that is under my judgment, but the very thing that has produced it, the river, that which um, Egypt depended upon for everything they had. And so it is with man. God's judgment has not just fallen upon man's sins at the cross, but uh, fallen upon uh, his judgment. Uh, we read, don't we, in um, uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, the Lord Jesus, it says, uh, coming in the likeness, God sent his Son in the likeness of flesh of sin um, and for sin, that he might uh, condemn sin in the flesh. That's not the sins of the flesh. They were, they were, they were judged at the cross. Uh, it's sin in the flesh. It's the flesh itself, that which produced the sins. Man's nature, that also was judged at the cross. The Lord Jesus coming, uh, taking a place in that fallen order of things, because he did. Uh, that's what I think it means when it says in the likeness of flesh of sin. He himself uh, in no way, um, uh, that sin was not seen in him. Uh, morally, uh, he was not of that order. But as far as his manhood was concerned, it was the same manhood as those around him. Uh, it was no different. It was the same manhood. Uh, and he took a place in that order of things. He could be traced right back to Adam it would speak of in one of the genealogies in the Gospels. Um, and in dying upon that cross, that order was finished with. It was condemned. Uh, God's judgment fell upon it. So man has been judged by God, both his sins and that which produced the sin, his nature. And this is what the rod would speak of. God's wrath against man, against the matter of sin, whether it's the nature of sin or the sins that are produced, all must come under God's judgment. And so God tells Moses uh, to go on before the people, take the rod that smote us the river, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb. Horeb. This is where the rock is here. Of course, the rock speaks of the same one. Uh, it speaks of Christ in both figures. But the location is different in both, in both figures. Here it is Horeb. Uh, in the next uh, passage that we read, it is in Kadesh. We read that Kadesh was 11, 11 days journey from Horeb. So the places are, are not the same. The rock, of course, speaks of the same, same one. Um, but Horeb was a, a fearful place. It was a dreadful place. Uh, Moses speaks of Horeb in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 2 the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers but with us even us who are all of us here alive this day the Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord for ye were afraid 
by reason of the fire, and went not up into the mount. So in Horeb, we see the holiness of God. And in the fire, his wrath against anything which is not in accord with himself. And so, Moses can say later on again to the Israelites, uh, when he warns them about forsaking the covenant that was given to them in Horeb, he says, for, thy, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. God is jealous concerning his own glory. Um, and his wrath will fall upon anything that is not in accord with that glory. And the fire, as a consuming fire, it will be completely destroyed, taken out from before him. And so this is the context of the rock in Horeb. It is the sinfulness of man. This has all come up before God, and it will be settled in Horeb. And God commands Moses to smite the rock. And so the Lord Jesus, he took our place. He took, the, he took the place that belonged to the sinner. And he himself bore that terrible judgment. Uh, he was smitten by God. Uh, here it is the rod of God's wrath. And uh, we read in Lamentations, Chapter 3, verse 1, I am the man. The G Jeremiah, the prophet, speaks of prophetically of Christ himself. And no doubt this uh, has an application to Israel in the coming day. But it's put in these such personal terms. Um, in, in Isaiah 53, it's plainly the nation, we, um, the, 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 psalmist, the, the, the uh, prophet speaks, in, those, in that way, we, but here it is I. I am the man uh, that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me, brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. And again in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So the wrath of God fell upon his own son, the Lord Jesus, who died upon that cross and suffered that terrible judgment in order that God could go out towards man not on the ground of his sin but on the ground of what the Lord had accomplished upon that cross the ransom uh, that uh, now uh, had been uh, um, um, had been brought about through his death and here in this chapter in this passage we don't read of the people drinking. We do in, in the next passage, we read that the people and their cattle, they drank of the water. But here, it simply says that the people may drink. In this uh, passage in, in Exodus, uh, the water flows from the rock. We get that in the next passage, in, in, um, in uh, uh, Numbers, where... God says to Moses, give the people to drink. But here, he says to Moses that the people might drink. It's, it's the desire of his heart that the people of Israel uh, should have their need met by his mercy. Um, and so, the aspect of things here is God's provision for man. Um, it is the fact that he, in grace, is going out to man, that he desires, as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that all men should be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 
Um, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So that ransom is available to all men. There's sufficient merit in the, in the death of the Lord Jesus, in the sacrifice he made upon that cross, uh, to satisfy the need of every man, woman and child in this world uh, in regard to their sins. But it's available, in that sense it's a ransom for all. But not all avail themselves of it. Uh, only those who trust in the, in the Lord Jesus as their saviour avail themselves of that ransom. And in that sense, it's a ransom for many. But um, this uh, passage that is before us, perhaps it could be really summed up by those words in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the well, that well-known verse, the wages of sin is death. Israel, we see Israel in all their unbelief. We see God's anger, his wrath against that, the sin of that nation. But the, um, uh, the, the rod of his wrath does not fall upon Israel. It falls upon the rock. The Lord Jesus is the one who suffered uh, the wrath of God upon the cross. And so now the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we go on to the next passage in Numbers, we read that things haven't changed in regard to Israel. Uh, they complain to God or complain to Moses in regard to their state. They're still in that state of unbelief. Uh, they uh, complain against God. They complain against Moses. And so the heart of that nation hasn't changed. It remains the same. Um, and just as man's heart does not change, it remains the same. But there is a difference now. Moses doesn't come before God uh, with an evil report regarding Israel. Um, we read in verse 6, Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their face, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Previously, it was a matter of Israel's responsibility. Moses uh, went with the elders uh, of Israel, with that which we said sp speaks of accountability, responsibility before God. But now Moses is not accompanied by the elders. He's accompanied by Aaron, who would set forth the priesthood of the Lord Jesus. And um, he doesn't bring this evil report uh, as, as previously, but rather he goes to the door of the uh, tabernacle of meeting. Um, and the glory of the Lord appears unto them. So now we have a different ground entirely. This is the ground of grace. God no longer has Israel before him in all their sin. Uh, he, has a, he doesn't have man in the flesh before him. He has another man altogether. He has the one who died on the cross and now has ascended up into heaven and is seated at his right hand. And so in Hebrews we read that neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So the Lord Jesus, the, the um, work upon the cross is finished, and in all the efficacy of that work, by his own blood, he enters once into the holy place, uh, having obtained eternal redemption. And so now the matter of uh, the rock being smitten is, has been completed. Now 
the thought of the rock now is not a smitten rock, but rather an exalted rock. And the word for rock in this passage in Numbers is a different word to that which is used previously of the rock in Horeb. Uh, the name of the rock in Horeb uh, is Sur, S-U-R, but in Kadesh, the word for rock is a different word, it's, it's Selah, uh, which comes from a, a root word meaning lofty or high, exalted. And so this is why the location is different in Numbers, um, because the Lord Jesus now he is ascended up in high, he's ascended up on high in the glory of heaven, seated at the right hand of his God and Father, having accomplished the work. Um, and now he is there as a high priest uh, with that ministry of grace. And it is through him that we draw near, because this uh, passage uh, is different to the previous one in, in as much as previously. It was a matter of God in grace going out to man. But now it is a matter of God, of man through grace drawing near to God. And so this is why, no doubt, Moses comes to the door of the tabernacle. It speaks of entrance into his presence. The glory of God appears to Moses. Uh, and this is the hope of, the, of those who have trusted in, in, in the Lord. Uh, we read, don't we, in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Once we were alienated from the life of God, once we were alienated in, in an enemy's in mind, but now through Christ we, we are brought near and the hope that we have uh, is that which we once had fallen short of, God's glory, but now we rejoice in hope of that glory. And the Lord Jesus said, didn't he, in his prayer to his father in John 17. Um, I would, he said, that those whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, uh, that they may behold my glory, uh, the glory that thou gavest me, because thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And so now uh, the glory of God is our portion. Uh, and perhaps there's a, there's a um, perhaps that's uh, uh, hinted at here when Moses uh, comes before Jehovah uh, at the door of the tent of meeting and God's glory appears to him. And the Lord speaks to Moses and says, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. And so God tells Moses to take the rod. Now this isn't the rod that Moses had taken previously. Uh, the rod that was used by Moses to smite the river in Egypt. Uh, no, this is the rod, in, we, we read of in verse 9, that was before the Lord. So it's a reference to the rod that belonged to Aaron and was laid up before the Lord um, in the tabernacle of witness. Uh, you remember uh, how um, there had been uh, those who had uh, said to Moses that why should, you, why should Aaron be the one who ministers before the Lord? Uh, is, they say, is not the whole... Um, congregation ho holy, and uh, so these three men, Korah, um, uh, Nathan, and uh, uh, um, uh, let me just find that. Nathan and Abiram, uh, they think they have the the right uh, to take that place and to. Uh, take Aaron's place, a minister before Jehovah, as he is doing. And so the whole thing is settled. Um, uh, uh, after, the, after these three men have been dealt with by God in such a terrible way, so serious was their sin, uh, the whole thing is dealt with so that the controversy is settled forever. 
And uh, God tells Israel, the nation, the um, tribes of Israel, each tribe must present a rod um, before the Lord. And uh, every rod must be laid up um, in the tabernacle witnessed by Moses, Aaron's rod uh, among them. And uh, God would indicate to them uh, the man that he had chosen to stand before himself. And so the rods were laid up in the tabernacle witness. And uh, in the morning, uh, Aaron's rod had uh, budded, brought forth buds, uh, let me just find the scripture. Uh, Numbers 17, verse 8. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of the witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And so uh, this speaks of resurrection it speaks of life that which was dead uh, this uh, rod this staff uh, now it showed uh, that it was living and um, uh, we have four stages uh, first of all the rod budded and then it brought forth buds um, I think perhaps there's plainly a distinction between these two things Perhaps the first one that it budded, it would speak of those um, that indication of life when a stem uh, that's living uh, has little nodules on it, um, which are difficult to see, difficult to recognise what they are if you're not looking for them, if you don't know what you're looking for. And uh, when the Lord was first risen, you remember, uh, his people... Uh, they didn't recognize him. There were two on the road to Emmaus. It says their eyes were withholden that they might not know him. Uh, Mary Magdalene, she thought he was the gardener uh, until he revealed himself to her. The disciples, um, when, when they were told of the Lord's resurrection, uh, it says that uh, they were as, as, as idle tales. They didn't believe it. Thomas, he said, unless he had absolute proof, then he wouldn't believe it. And so they didn't um, know that the Lord had risen, even though he had risen, until he showed himself to them. And we read in Acts, don't we, that he showed himself to them by many fallible proofs. Uh, so there could be no question uh, that he was risen from the dead. And uh, perhaps this would be the buds that came forth, the plain evidence of life. And then the blossoms came, and they would speak of the glory of the, of the, of the plant, um, the glory of the almond tree, its blossom. And um, uh, this speaks of the Lord uh, having suffered. Now he enters into his glory. Uh, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And then the almonds come. Uh, the, the staff yielded almonds. And this is uh, the fruit of the, of the almond tree. Uh, the Lord Jesus, the living one, the one who uh, lives, who became dead and behold is alive forevermore. And then the fruit the result of his death and resurrection. Uh, those who are his, uh, we live uh, because he lives. His life uh, is in himself. He is the living one. Uh, our life, the eternal life we possess, is in him uh, and, and uh, through him. And we're, so we are the, we are the fruit, uh, the, the fruit of the travel of his soul. And we share with him um, in all that he has won uh, through his death and through his resurrection. And share with him in all that God has given him uh, through grace. And so um, this is the rod that is before the Lord, before Jehovah, speaking of Christ 
uh, the one who is before him, uh, the one who ministers uh, in regards um, uh, who uh, um, uh, mediates um, on behalf of man in things pertaining to God, as we read in Hebrews. And so Moses takes up the rod and uh, company with Aaron, his brother, God instructs him to speak unto the rock in the uh, before the eyes of the whole uh, of Israel and he says and it shall give forth his water speak to the rock and it shall give forth his water the Lord Jesus ascended up on high in the glory of heaven this is the exercise of faith to speak to the rock it means that we believe um, we believe the truth concerning the Lord Jesus. We believe upon him. We speak to him. It's a matter of believing. Moses was uh, rebuked by God for unbelief because he didn't speak to the rock. He didn't believe God. Um, speaking to the rock is the exercise of faith. And we see that in John chapter 4 uh, with the woman at the well when uh, the Lord says uh, to her in John chapter 4 verse 10 um, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee give me to drink thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water she would have spoken to the rock and the rock would have given up its water that life uh, that, that uh, flows out from him to all who put their trust in him. And so uh, we, we see here an application of the time. Um, the, the water the flowing out from the Lord, the living water, waters of life uh, in, in the Holy Spirit, uh, the blessing uh, that is ours uh, through simply turning to him in faith, and uh, asking from him the blessing that he is so willing to give. Uh, such is the grace of God. And so Moses has his instruction. Um, and as a result, God says to Moses, So shalt thou give the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses takes the rod from before the Lord as God commanded him. And um, Moses and Aaron together, uh, they gather the congregation together before the rock in verse 10. But now we find that Moses doesn't do that which God told him to do. Moses, he says, hear now ye rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. So Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes it. When it says he struck the rock twice, um, I think it's referring to the fact that he'd struck it once already, in Horeb, and now he strikes it again in, um, in Kadesh. In that sense, he struck it twice. And um, his heart is full of anger because of Israel's unbelief and rebellion. And so he addresses the, the uh, people as rebels, and he says, must we fetch you water out of the rock? In other words, he's saying, you don't deserve this in all your unbelief and sin. And so God is angry with Moses because he didn't do what he had told him to do. Now, are we to see this simply as a terrible mistake on the part of Moses, which has spoilt the, the, the picture, spoilt the type? 
Or are we to draw from what Moses did further lessons, which this um, uh, picture would, uh, would teach us? Uh, well, I, I think it's the latter. It must be the latter. Uh, because there's no idle word in Scripture. And um, from this we learn, first of all, God's, um, how God uh, uh, um, would view this uh, second striking uh, so seriously. Um, because the Lord Jesus, we read, um, It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. The work of the Lord Jesus was complete. Uh, having completed that work, uh, there was no need for him now to stand as those high priests, had, as those priests had to do under the law. Uh, because they offered up sacrifices that could never take away sins, could never settle the conscience in regard to sin. But, the, but we have this contrast with the Lord. Having offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down, he didn't have to officiate anymore in regard to this matter. He had finished the work and he sat down on the right hand of God. Um, and this is the one whom God has before him. This man, he, he doesn't have man in all his sins before him now. He has the Lord Jesus, the one who suffered for sins. Um, and, and on account of that, this is why he can go out to man in grace. A man can draw near to him through grace. Because of that one who sits at his, who sits at his right hand in the glory of heaven. And so, in striking the Rock twice. Mo uh, Moses denied that truth. Um, it, it, it was uh, it was to um, dishonour the personal work of Christ in doing so. Although of course he didn't know that. But also, it tells us something else. Um, it tells us that the, the law cannot change its voice. Uh, Moses had condemned Israel in the first instance, you remember. He had brought Israel's sin before God, which is all the law can do. And now we find uh, that that hasn't changed. The law remains the same. He addresses the people as rebels. He uh, um, makes their uh, state plain. And that's what the law does in regard to sinful man. Um, but uh, in, in doing this, um, he doesn't have the mind of, of the law of, of God, because, as we've said, it is no longer man in the flesh uh, that is before God, but it is the one who has died, risen out of death and sits at his right hand. Um, the one who, uh, Hebrews tells us, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesties in the heavens, Hebrews chapter eight, verse one. And then Hebrews chapter 10, having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so it is through him that we, drew, that we draw near. It is through him uh, that uh, the matter of our sins has been settled. We never find in Hebrews uh, sins being spoken of because the blood of Christ uh, has settled that matter before God. The only sin we read of in Hebrews is the sin of apostasy. Uh, that is to profess faith in Christ and then 
turn away from him uh, and, and return to that which uh, we uh, had professed to have turned away from. Uh, and, and in doing so, it is to trample the Son of God underfoot, to speak of the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing, the sin of apostasy. Uh, that is to um, fall from grace. As a result, the Lord <clears throat> says to Moses, because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So Moses wasn't able to bring the children of Israel into the inheritance. And again, uh, this speaks of the law. Uh, the law cannot, could not bring Israel into that inheritance. Um, and uh, uh, um, God said to Moses that he, could, he would be able to see the land. Um, but he would not be able to bring the uh, Israelites into it. And so again, the law anticipates those good things to come. We read of the law, don't we? Again, in Hebrews chapter 10, that the law has a shadow of good, is a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things. The law anticipates the inheritance, uh, those good things that are to come, but it cannot bring them in. And so Moses, he saw the land, uh, but he could not bring the children of Israel in. When it comes to the good things to come, it is the Lord Jesus who brings those things in. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, we read that Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, the Lord alone, uh, brings in those good things, brings us into them. It is in him that we possess it, not the law. And so God says to Moses uh, that uh, he didn't uh, sanctify him in the eyes of the children of Israel. Um, but in verse 13 we read uh, the, of the waters of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. He was sanctified in his grace. Uh, grace met man in his sin. God, we read, he justifies the ungodly. We might think that God justifies the godly. But Romans tells us that God justifies the ungodly. It was while we were sinners that Christ died for us. It was when we were without strength um, that he died. And this is uh, God sanctifying himself in those who strove against him. He's sanctified not in his wrath, not in bringing down his wrath upon them, but he's sanctified in his grace toward them, in cleansing them of their sins, in uh, making us anew, bringing us into that new creation order of things under Christ, uh, giving us new birth, um, and uh, giving us a place amongst all them that are sanctified. In this way, God sanctifies himself uh, through his grace. And we close perhaps by looking at that scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, which speaks of this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus.